Uh, I'm excited this morning uh, to introduce a friend of mine, uh, Jacob Jester. Uh, he's a missionary kid. He was raised in Africa. His parents were missionaries. He was raised in Sierra Leone. Uh, later in his life, he, uh, his parents transitioned to Senegal, which is one of the new countries of missionaries that we are supporting. And uh, after that, he goes to Central Bible College, feels the call of God. He starts a long season as an evangelist, which is where Jacob and I, in my previous job, Jacob and I met. And uh, he did several camps and some things for me when I was uh, in Kentucky. Uh, after that season, and I'm not going to tell all of his story, he'll tell some of that he planned at a church in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, it was doing well, it was thriving, but always know God's call never leaves you. So even though you're living in the golf course capital of the world, you know, uh, he started feeling this nudge and this tug, and he's going to talk to you about that this morning, about the continent of Africa. It is the African continent is important to us as believers, but also we have a number of people that attend our church that are uh, native to Africa, and we want you to know that your continent and your people are important to us, and we're going to do everything we can to get the gospel uh, to Africa. So would you welcome to Generations Church my friend, missionary Jacob Jester. How are you? Really? I think some of you are better than others. I know it's a cold morning in Tallahassee, but I, uh, when I came down here, we, we based out of Springfield, Missouri for the time being, and when I came down here, it was uh, 16 degrees when I got in my car to drive to the airport, so that's actually cold. That's real cold right there. That's death. Um, but we've learned to try to work with it. Very excited to be here with the Nugent family and to be able to share what the Lord is doing in Africa and really excited about what God is doing in Generations Church. In fact, we have been one of your partners. You have been one of our partners now for a few months and we're very grateful for the investment and the intentionality for missions that Generations Church has worked to be a part of. So thank you for your investment. Thank you for your generosity and what God is doing through Generations Church across the world to support monthly 107 missionaries is no small task. You need to understand that is no small investment and the fact that you are standing with so many around the world makes a huge difference and I want to thank you from a missionary for what God is doing. So at some point today, take your hand and do this. But of course we know that God is doing that through you, amen. But let's be funny. So. I want to talk to you today, and I want to share a little bit of our story, and you can already see the picture of my family on the screen, but what I want to do today is very simple. I want to share with you about what God has done in us that has allowed us to be able to do what we're doing today with the hope and the anticipation that God will speak to many of you today to do the very same thing. There's a reason why this Sunday is called Send Sunday, because it's not just about staying Sunday. It's about sending people. And the fact that is, if we're going to be senders, we need to begin to believe that God can send people through us, but that God could send us. It's very easy for churches around this country who have become invested in missions to say, we will send people. But then we become in the midst of a struggle when we believe that God could be sending us or perhaps that God could be sending our children or that God could be sending our next door neighbor or that God could be sending our sons. We begin to pray, God, would you send someone? And what I'm asking is that perhaps God would speak to you that you would be willing to lay down everything that you have found to be comfortable to embrace the idea of serving God somewhere around the world that would make an impact and embrace unreached people groups all over the world, but specifically on the continent of Africa today. My hope and my prayer is that we would begin to pray, Father, would you start now today to send me? Would you begin to pray that with me this morning from the onset of this message? God, would you send someone and perhaps you could start that sending process in me first. My wife, Kristen, and I walked through this journey for 18 years now about what God could do and how he could send us. 
So I want to pray with you this morning. Before I get into the message, I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to you about what God could do through you today about being sent. Father, I ask that you would begin to move upon us from the very onset of your word. Father, I pray that grace and mercy would flow down from us even in this moment, God, that you would speak life, that you would speak encouragement, that you would speak your anointing and your promises. Father, we give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you all the honor. They belong to you now in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said amen. If you have your Bible, would you turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 37, verse number 1. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse Verse number one, it should also be on the screen. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. I want you for just a moment to use your imagination and I want you to picture the prophet Ezekiel being sent by the Spirit of the Lord and being put down in the middle of a valley that was full of dry bones. Bones that had somewhere along the way come and have met somewhere in the middle of this valley but no longer have life, no longer have breath in them. And I want you to, for just a moment to imagine this, this scenario and the setting of what it must have been like for the prophet Ezekiel to go standing in the middle of a valley of dry bones and then beginning to ask the Lord, can these bones live? Can these bones live? In fact, I want you to take note of what the scripture says that God asks the prophet Ezekiel. He says, can these bones live? And then I want you to notice for just a moment what the prophet Ezekiel says back to the Lord. He says, Only you know. I want you to understand that right now in this moment, in the hearts of many of you in this place, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to begin to ask you, can these bones live? It's more than just the city of Tallahassee and the state of Florida and the country that we live in. But see, you and I have been sent by the power of the Holy Spirit to stand in the middle of a valley of dry bones. And right now in this moment, God is asking generations, church, can these bones live? Can your family live? Can America live? Can the continent of Africa and the world experience a move of God that changes and shakes us from our core. Only God knows. But here is the powerful thing I want you to remember from the onset of the word is that God sent a man, God sent a human being to stand in the middle of the valley of dry bones and then said to him, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about a world that needs to know Jesus? What are you going to do about the continent of Africa with 867 unreached people groups? What are you going to do about the most urbanizing, the fastest growing, the youngest continent on the planet? What is your approach to an unreached world that needs a very real God? God said, can these bones Live and the prophet said, Only you know. When I was seven years old, my, my dad had a dream. He, he found himself in the middle of a dream and he, he was on an airplane. What was interesting about this dream is my dad was on an airplane, but he didn't know where he was and he didn't know where he was going. So in his dream, he was trying to orient himself to the sitting and the surrounding and the scenario in which he was finding himself. And he, he, he landed the plane. The plane landed on an airstrip. And my dad, in his dream, got out of the airplane. He saw at the bottom of the stairs. And as he walked to the bottom of the stairs and put his foot down on the asphalt runway, he, he started to look around to see where he was. And he realized that he was standing on the peninsula. He looked around, realizing that he was standing on a peninsula trying to get his bearings, and he saw that on the other side, to his left, there was a bay of water. He looked out across the bay of water and saw that on the other side of the bay of water were mountains that rose up from where the mountains met the beach, and there was a city that rose up on the mountains on the other side, and he could see twinkling lights from the city on the other side of the bay. 
Very next morning, he woke up and he ran to my mother and he said, I believe that the Lord is calling us into missions and I think the Lord has shown me where we're going to go. And my mom, she laughed out loud. She said, well, you go, I'm going to stay. And so my dad began to pray for my mother. He began to pray. He would say, Lord, I pray for my wife. I pray, God, that you would speak to her. God, I pray that you would speak to her about the situation. I know that you're calling us into missions. He would pray on his knees every day for my mother that God would speak to her. And my mom, she prayed too. She said, Jesus, I have no idea what crazy thoughts are getting into my husband's head, but I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would begin to let those thoughts be removed from his mind. My mom and dad tried to cancel each other out. They prayed, they tried to cancel each other's prayers, thinking that maybe one of them would be heard more by God, that perhaps the Lord would hear to them in a more powerful way. See, I have you to understand for just a moment as I get into the message that I'm the father of three amazing children. And I know from a parent's perspective that we don't always know what to say to our kids, do we? We don't always have the best answers for our kids' questions, do we? Especially when my kids try to defy my authority because I feel like I'm a pretty authoritarian person. Not really. I don't even have an intimidating look when I try to intimidate my children. <laughs> I try to bug my eyes. My eyes don't even bug very good. And I tell my kids, I need you to go take out the trash. And they say, well, why? Well, I'm going to need you to go downstairs, and I'm going to need you to clean up your room. Well, well, why? Because I'm tired of feeling sad when I go down there. (laughs) I'm tired of going down to the basement and finding ramen that's returned to its natural state. (laughs) Ramen returns to the state that it came from, which makes me wonder why we put that in our bodies. And I find myself trying to tell my kids to do something, and the question that they ask me is why. See, we don't always have the best most articulated responses to our children's questions, do we? And I wonder to myself from time to time why I've started to say to my kids the very same thing that my mom and my dad said to me that frustrated me when I was growing up. I need you to go and I need you to make your bed. Well, why? Because I said so. (laughs) That's why. I feel like in that moment I should drop the mic and walk away because I said so. And it frustrated me when my mom and dad said that to me, but here I am saying the very same thing to my own children. And this is what I've learned about the the words, because I said so, and the frustration behind it. It's because, because I said so has no explanation. Because I said so is filled with ambiguity. And because I said so has to rely on trust and belief. We have to believe in our relationship with our sons and daughters that there is implied trust and understanding, which takes me back to our scripture for just a moment. It says, the hand of the Lord was upon me. What you and I are seeing in this moment is one of the most intense, dark, and powerful moments in all of the scripture. And because I like to use my imagination, I begin to wonder to myself what Ezekiel saw standing in the valley of dry bones. And as I peel back the layers of the scripture and begin to find the missional aspects that speak to you, that speak to a generation, this is the first one I want you to be reminded of. Every purpose has power, but only if put into practice. Every purpose has power, but only if put into practice. This is what I mean. It means that if we have a Sunday at Generations Church and we talk about the power of sending and talk about the power of the faith promise to send 107 missionaries around the world and to have a vision that begins to believe that we can reach people all over the world for the gospel among unreached people groups to plant the church, a healthy church within walking distance of every African, and yet we do not find our purpose in that and begin to invest in the vision of the house of God, we may say to ourselves, we believe in the vision, but if there is no investment in the vision, then everything we say is merely lip service to a vision rather than the embrace of it and the investment into it. If you believe in what God is doing here, if you believe in reaching people around the world, then Sin Sunday becomes what can I do to reach people around the world Sunday in my own personal context. If you have a purpose, then put your purpose into practice to invest in missions around the world for the sake of a man or a woman that has never heard the name Jesus before. 
See, it means I live my life on purpose in the order that God has given me to pursue the power of the Holy Spirit in my life to bring change to the world around me and the world that I may never set my foot. That is the power of missions. In other words, order implies that you and I have a place, a place where we do what God has called us to do, a place where we live that vision out. I love my children, but they have a way of critiquing me. Have you ever been critiqued by a 10-year-old? Has a 10-year-old ever looked at you and said, this is the problem? That happens to me with my own children. I was cutting my hair short on the sides because I'm prematurely gray, as you can see. And my son came to me one day and he said, that looks terrible. He said, you've got to grow your hair out. And I said, fine, I challenge you. I will grow it out and then you'll be terrified. So I'm in that process right now. My kids always say to me that I'm eccentric. And I didn't really know what that meant. And that frustrated me a little bit because my kids would tell me that I was eccentric. But I didn't know what the definition meant to them. And I thought to myself, maybe it means because I picked them up from school with the windows rolled down and 80s music blaring. It's possible that's it. It's possible that I like to make every song sung in an operatic way because I find it delightful. <laughs> Perhaps that's it. And then recently, my wife and I were walking into a store. and We found a man. We saw a man as we were shopping who was also walking, pushing a shopping cart. But he was pushing it like this. <laughs> and my wife said, do you see that man? Yes, I do. She said, that's eccentric. <laughs> she said, that's you. That's something you would do. And for about 11 seconds, I was offended. Until I thought to myself, that's something I would do. <laughs> now I understand why my kids tell me that I'm eccentric. See, what I believe that the Lord is speaking to somebody in the room today is that you've been trying to figure out what your pace, your place, your purpose, and your order is in the mission that God has called the church of Jesus Christ to be a part of. You've let other people try to tell you who you are. You've let other people try to define the expectations that God has placed upon you to tell you this is what you should begin to do. But if you do not know the order that God has given you to be a part of the global mission of God, then you will struggle every time you walk into a Sunday like this because you will try to understand what the church's expectations are to you, what the people's expectations are for you, rather than what God's expectations are to you. See, we are found in our purpose and our placement we are found in our purpose but see God uses our purpose to place us into situations where we can begin to make the biggest impact that we were born to make I am not at a disillusionment I know that many of you will never set foot on the continent of Africa but why wouldn't you want to make a difference in global mission because we have been called by the church of Jesus Christ to make a difference not only only in the neighbors around us but across the world that's why we pray that's why we give that's why we go that's why you should go to Antigua that's why you should embrace the mission of God because it's more than just telling the story it's about experiencing it for ourselves. that is where you are changed in the middle of purpose that combines with mission and vision you will find the placement that God has called you to be a part of reaching the world world for missions to stand in the middle of a valley of dry bones and say to the Lord what am I supposed to do here and God says can these bones live and you say only you know but notice what God said to the prophet he said speak to these bones speak to these bones in 2018 my wife and I were living in Phoenix, Arizona, pastoring a church. A church that we had planted, a church that we had started, a church that we had fallen in love with, a city that we had fallen in love with. And even though I was, had spent hearts and lives of part of myself being in love with missions, in love with the continent of Africa, we, we weren't sure what the Lord was saying to us in the moment until the Lord began to speak to us personally about our mission. 
until the Lord began to speak to us personally about our vision. And I remember when we had to set our children down on the floor in the middle of our living room and tell them what God was doing in us. And I remember holding my son Cruz in our arms and Jude sat on the floor and Indy was being held by my wife Kristen. And we sat on the floor and we told our children we were letting go of everything and leaving everything that we loved for the sake of the continent of Africa and 48 countries that are a part of our region. And immediately I could sense the fear and the trepidation in our children. Because I'm a statistics person, I began to tell them about statistics. I said, did you know that we have 21 countries on the continent of Africa that have no Assemblies of God missionary? I said, I, I bet you didn't know, because you're seven. I bet you didn't know that the continent of Africa is the fastest growing, the most urbanizing, and the youngest continent on the planet. I, I bet you didn't know that the United Nations predicts that by the year 2100, just 80 years from now, that the continent of Africa will triple in population size and be 4.3 billion people just in the next 80 years. I bet you didn't know that by the year 2035 that the UN predicts that one out of every four people on the planet will be an African. I bet you didn't know that. And in that moment, my sons and my daughter didn't understand the statistics. They just knew that they were getting ready to be ripped from everything that they knew to embrace the sake of the power of the unknown. Did you know that most of the time we like to say to ourselves that when we are at our best is when we are most comfortable? But you need to understand, as followers of Jesus, you've not been called to comfort. In this life, as you and I have been called to follow Jesus, the promises of God have never been to have a life of ease and a life of comfort. In fact, sometimes the will of God is the most dangerous place that you can be. I've always been frustrated when people say that the safest place to be is in the middle of the will of God because I fundamentally disagree. The most dangerous place oftentimes to be is in the middle of the will of God. And as my family was embracing the call of God to serve on the continent of Africa, we begin to understand that from my family, family, for us, for the vision that God had placed in us, we must be willing to embrace danger and uncertainty and discomfort for the sake of the church of Jesus Christ, for 100 million people in the middle of Central Africa that have never heard the name Jesus, for the nation of Mauritania that hasn't had a missionary in 20 years, for the nation of Sudan that had to be completely disrupted by global war and had all of our missionaries expelled 10 years ago why because regardless of the struggle there is still a God who looks at his church just like you and says can these bones live and your answer to God may be I am not sure but what will you do when God says then speak to these bones Speak to these bones. And the scripture says, speak to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. That's why missionaries leave everything that they have. That's why they go to Africa and Asia Pacific and Latin America. That's why missionaries leave what they know and they understand and walk away from their comfort to embrace the valley of dry bones. Because God has called them not to be a hero, but to speak to dead bones. And perhaps the Lord would say something like that to you today as Pastor Brent comes back to play this beautiful machine. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. It was full of bones. And the prophet said, I don't know. God said, can these bones live? And the prophet said, only you know if they can live. A couple of years ago, we sent a member of our team to northern Ghana to dig a water well. I don't need the whole band yet, just FYI. Just my, just my keyboard player. This will be even better. <laughs> we 
We sent a member of our team to northern Ghana to dig a, a water well. And so what we knew that we were doing, we went to dig the water wells because the continent of Africa is the most water-scarce continent on the planet. We like to say that water is life, but in Africa we also see that water is death. There are pockets of places in Africa where young ladies, because it's mostly young ladies who have to walk through this experience, will, will go down to the water source. They'll go down to the river or they will go down to the mud, trampled, animal infested pool. And they will go to draw water and waiting just below the surface of the water are crocodiles. And there are certain pockets and places in Africa where young ladies and some young boys have lost limbs because they have gone to draw water because all oh, the water is life. Water in the wrong place can be death. And so we went to northern Ghana to dig a water well because we recognized that this part of Ghana had been requesting one of our team to come and to dig this well. And there we were, a member of our team had gone to dug this well, but what we decided to do is that we were not going to leave physical water without leaving the living water. And so the determination was made to plant the church at the same time. Dig the well, build the church. Give water and give Jesus at the same time. And so the water was dug. They begin to dig into the northern Ghana red clay. And as the day came where the water was coming and the well had been built, people from all over the region came to be a part of this experience. They finally had a place where they could get clean water and they didn't have to go as far. They just came to that one place to get the water. And the church was established at the same time and a man by the name of Timothy became the pastor. Pastor Timothy was zealous for Jesus. And it wasn't but just a matter of weeks that the church was full of people. The church was full of people because people were coming to experience water and there was living water given to them at the same time and a move of God erupted in that part of the region and there was a moment that happened one day that changed the trajectory of the church. Pastor Timothy got a knock at his door. And he went and they opened the door and there standing in front of him was a man who'd converted recently from Islam. He told Pastor Timothy, he said, I'm here because I, I want to be baptized. And Pastor Timothy was overjoyed and overwhelmed because he'd been waiting for this moment. He told him, he said, if you'll come back in two weeks, we'll have a baptism service and I can't wait to baptize you. Pastor Timothy said goodbye, started to close the door, and when he did, the man put his hand there, pushed the door back open, and said, no, I'd, I'd like to be baptized now. Pastor Timothy looked around, and he saw that there was no pool, there was no water source, but there was a well. And so he went, and he put his hand on the spigot, and began to pump the water, and the water spilled down onto the ground and began to make mud there in the clay of northern Ghana, and Pastor Timothy told the man to lay down in it, and he did. He said, roll around. And he rolled around. And he said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And see, if you understand in Islamic context, when a man in his Islamic context experiences Jesus, the members of the family decide to make the decision as well. And this man had decided to be baptized publicly, which was one of the greatest feats of faith that he'd ever done in his entire life. Just to accept Jesus in an Islamic context is not enough. But to be baptized means to the world, to your family, to your community, that this is an outward expression of an inward commitment that you've made. So let the world say what the world wants to say. I will show my faith to the world around me and that's exactly what began to happen his family the area the region experienced a move of God because one man decided to be baptized and there was another knock at Pastor Timothy's door there standing in the doorway was this man and his wife and she just like he said I want to be baptized now pumped the water. She laid in the mud in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. A move of God erupted. 
See, whenever we find ourselves standing in the middle of a valley of dry bones, we have to recognize that there is always potential, even in the middle of the struggle. For some of you in the room that look at a scenario and a situation and say, how can God bring me through? Be reminded that it's a part of your responsibility to find how you can pray, how you can give, and how you can go. Because there are communities just like this one all over the continent of Africa that are waiting for somebody like you that are waiting for you to say I'll go but more than that go I'll send and I'll pray but I'll send and I'll give but I'll send and I'll send and I'll go as well there is a continent with 21 countries that have no assemblies of God missionary waiting for someone like you who will stand in the middle of the valley of dry bones and say I will speak to these dry bones Prophesy to the bones, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Prophesy in the middle of a valley of dry bones, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Your job is to preach the gospel. But some of you, your job is to go. After seven years, I have no timer. I can keep track of nothing. After seven years, my mom and dad finally got on the same page. Their prayers didn't cancel each other. And they went and they sat in front of a group of men and women in Springfield, Missouri to hear about the need on the continent of Africa. And my dad, after an hour of hearing of country after country that needed a worker, my dad was frustrated. And he started to push back the table was standing to his feet, and, and, and a man named Don grabbed him by his coat and said, wait, we need someone to serve in Sierra Leone. And my dad sat down, and he said, okay, tell me about that place. He said, Sierra Leone is four million people who've been wrecked by civil war. The entire blood diamond trade has spilled over from Liberia. Child soldiers that have killed each other in the streets. Eight-year-old boys who are carrying AK-47s and forced to kill their own siblings. He said Sierra Leone's population is four million people, but probably half of them are under the age of 18. At one time, Freetown had been called the Athens of West Africa, but now it lied and ruined. Raw sewage had run down the streets. He said, for you to get there is no easy task. For you to get there, you will land in the plain on a strip of asphalt that sets on the peninsula. And and when you get down to the bottom of those stairs, he said, you'll look around and you'll see that you're surrounded on three sides by water. But if you look out across the bay of water, you'll see that on the other side of the bay is a city that rises up on the mountains from where the mountains meet the beach. And on the city line there, on the mountains, is the city capital, Freetown. And in 1989, my mom and dad became missionaries to Freetown, Sierra Leone, and West Africa, where they served as missionaries off and on over the course of the next 25 years, retiring in 2016. And for many years, I didn't know the story. And for many years, I didn't understand the story. For many years, I didn't understand what it was like for my mom and dad to walk away from family who didn't understand them and disagreed with them and rejected them. I I didn't understand what it was like for their own mother and father to say, why would you go to people you don't know when you could stay here with us? I didn't understand what it was like for them to make a decision like this until I embraced this decision for myself. Until I said to my children, we're going to go to Africa. Until I said to my wife, this is what God is saying. And we were in agreement. Why? Because there is power in agreement when you have been on the same page. So I decided that this is what God was saying. And just like every missionary does, we had to raise money. I looked through the minister's directory and I called a man just randomly named Pastor Gary. 
And I called Pastor Gary. And Pastor Gary listened to my spiel, my elevator pitch. And then finally, at the, at the end of it, he said, don't worry. We'll stand with you. And here's why. He said, because in 1992, he said, I was a youth pastor of a small church. And I was sitting in the audience when your dad came to talk about their call to Sierra Leone. And your dad said that everything's ready. We're ready to go. The Bible school that I'm going to teach at is ready to go. The people of Sierra Leone that desperately need Jesus. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be there. My family's ready to go. We have been preparing for three years to go to the place that God has called us to be. He said, I'm ready. But the finances aren't there yet. And this pastor said to me, he said, I determined in my heart right then and there in 1992 that a missionary would never come stand in front of me and have to say that I'm ready, but the people have not given the money yet. He said, so I'll stand with you because I know that you're ready and I want to be the one to send you. There are people in this room who are senders. There are people in this room that you are going to send. You're going to walk and you're going to look at this faith promise card and you're going to make a decision to send people around the world because you are a sender. Oh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord for senders, hallelujah. Bless the Lord for people like you who send 107 missionaries around the world. Thank you, Jesus, for people like you who say, I will sin. I will make a commitment and I will financially sacrifice to send a missionary around the world to go to a place like Sierra Leone where my mom and my dad served before they went to Senegal to see a healthy church planted within walking distance of every person in that country because you and people like you are senders. And maybe you will make a commitment in your spirit this morning to say, I will never have a missionary stand in front of us again that will say, I'm ready. But no one has completely sent us yet. Be the sender that God has destined you to be because there are people just like Pastor Timothy who are ministering to people just like that today all over the continent of Africa who are waiting for you to send are waiting for you to go. Oh yes. Oh yes. Some of you have heard God say go and you haven't done it yet because your seat is comfortable. Can you go to Antigua? Yes. Can you come to Africa? You should be a prayer, a giver, and a goer. We're going to do something a little bit different, Pastor. We, you know we're going to do this, but we're going to do something a little bit different. Samuel is going to come, and we did talk. We talked. Samuel's from Nigeria. Nigerians are everywhere. There's always a Nigerian. There's <laughs> always a Nigerian. And Samuel's going to pray in his native language in just a moment. He's going to pray for the peoples of Africa. I specifically want you to pray for something right now that I shared with Pastor Brian this morning. In northern Cameroon and in northern Nigeria, we have no worker, no Assemblies of God worker. And that area is the largest grouping of unreached peoples in all of Africa. There are 100 million people in that area 
who have no access to the gospel and have no one working among them from our fellowship. So Samuel, I'm going to ask you to pray that God would send workers there. And you know what? More than that, I'm going to pray that God calls some of you to respond to that need right now in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, I pray that now in the name of Jesus that somebody in this house would say, yes, I will go. Yes, I will go. Yes, I will go. Yes, I will go. In the name of Jesus. Samuel, would you pray? All right, I'll be praying in my language, in Yoruba language. And the prayer is just to pray for the continent of Africa and to pray that the Lord will send um, missionaries, that the Lord will empower the pastors and the preachers of the gospel in all the regions. Africa <laughs> And my phone on the Agbara, Agbara to one in low, Lati She She Yanu, Agbara to one in low, Lati Pulungo, who called Jesu Christi Kakri, Bobori Lady, Agbadrak, where my room on the Agbara, Agbadrak, where my dewom, Agbadrak, where I'm watching the Relati, we be Bobo, and my room or Lossy Relay, the Africa, and my room or Lati Lotoy, Molle, who called Jesu Christi. Agbadrafu Nigeria, Agbadrafu I want BT, I want in your team, Bonnie Paru called Jesus Christiri, Agbadrak be my run, I want Oshishen, my run on Lossibe, Lati She Shami, Ishe Yano Fun Ru called Jesus Christi, Lati Bulongo Jesus Christi, Lati 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 from village to village, Lati Bugbori led the car killing in Africa, Agbadrak be my run on Lot, IBT I want in your date, Lati Bulongo Jesus Christi, and my run when you're in my run. If there's ever a church that should have an understanding of the African continent, it's this church. We've been blessed to have wonderful people expatriates from Africa that are here and it's made me more aware of the the spiritual need in that uh, in that region we have African fellowship that meets every other uh, Friday night they met this past uh, Friday night so we're seeing God do something it's unusual but the Africans that are here God is, uh, is speaking to so I want to uh, we're fixing to do baptism in just a second. Bo and the kids are coming in. But as I, as I mentioned today, is Sin Sunday. And if you are a visitor, new, this is not for you. If you're a regular that goes here, this is for you, okay? I'm coming at you. Every dollar that we raise is not about the kingdom here. It doesn't pay mortgages. It's not part of our, you know, our financial structure here. It goes out, okay? So I'm asking you this morning as you leave, and I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Kids are going to come in. We're going to celebrate with baptisms in just a moment. But I'm going to ask you uh, to consider a very generous uh, contribution, faith promise for 2023. As I mentioned, the average gift to a missionary is $65. Uh, that's just average. And if you can only do 10, I'll take 10. If you can only do 25, I'll take it. If you can do one missionary, that'd be great. If you could do two, three, four, five, I want you to be generous. Jacob told me at dinner last night, he said, I've got some missionaries that I need to get over there. Can I send you their name and their account numbers? And I said, you send them on. It's always dangerous when they go to dinner with me because they make the pitch. Okay, so uh, we want to be able to increase our missionary footprint. And I just think we can do it very, very easily here. So, Lord, I thank you that, Lord, from the poorest zip code in Florida, 
from a church that is on Tennessee Street in Blountstown. For whatever reason, Lord, you're giving us a global impact. And Lord, I pray today, Lord, as we consider the spiritual need around the world, God, I pray that you would speak to the hearts and the lives of people that go to church here, Lord. And, and maybe you're calling some to make a physical move, but Lord, for all you're calling us to send and to do something unbelievable, Lord, for missions for 2023. So God, I pray that you would speak to every heart. I pray that the spirit of the Lord would lay, lay this burden upon our hearts, Lord, that we collectively can do something unbelievable in, in 2023. And Lord, I just give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.